He teaches a course on smart cities to hundreds of students every semester. And he takes them on the tour to meet with local and regional governments to understand their smart cities issues and how to address them. He is so passionate about smart cities. Uh, and I want you to hear from him, not, not from me. So let me invite uh, Professor Solomon Darwin, uh, the Executive Director of Center for Corporate Innovation at UC Berkeley Haas School of Business. I would like to recognize the state of Andhra Pradesh that is building the first smart city in the world. Mm -hmm. Mr. J. Chowdhury is here to represent the AP government. Uh, he's the IT expert. He built a uh, high-tech city. And uh, under the uh, inspiration of Chandra Babu Naidu. And he's also building the upcoming smart cities, Vizak, as well as Amravati. And he's here with us. Uh, we'll hear from him. I would like to, um, my students, uh, this last semester, went to Vizak to make Vizak smart because it's the first smart city that's being built. Uh, we have my students were engineers, and the other ones are business students. And uh, AP government is the forerunner in, uh, in building smart cities. And I just want to recognize the state of Andhra Pradesh for taking the lead in the world, uh, in that part of the world, in building smart cities. Uh, Mr. Chaudhary, would you please come and uh, grace uh, uh, the, the chair here, please? I would also like to have the rest of the panel to come and uh, take their seats. I will have them uh, introduce themselves uh, one by one as we begin with uh, the Q&A for this panel. Before we, we begin um, and ask them to introduce themselves and the areas of expertise, uh, I would like to uh, um, give you a definition here of what a smart city is. No one knows what it is. You ask people, they'll give you 101 definitions. But let me give you one definition here. Based on analysis of over 116 existing definitions on smart cities, the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe and the International Telecommunications Union have together developed a definition for a smart city. And this is what it says. A city that uses information and communication technologies and other means to improve quality of life, efficiency of urban operations and services, and competitiveness, while ensuring that it meets the needs of present and future, and future generations' needs with respect to economic, social, and environmental um, needs, as well as cultural aspects. That is the definition. It's, it's a long sentence. I think it is very comprehensive. At, at UC Berkeley, where I teach, we have a different definition. Uh, we are a business school, and so ours is based more on the business model. It's a business model point of view. A city that creates value by forming an ecosystem of partnerships, through shared resources and technologies of all kinds that saves time, eliminate, eliminates costs, generates new sources of revenue for, for its technologies for all kinds of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, to its constituents and captures some of the value by delivering triple bottom line, which is economic, social, and environmental. So our definition is based on the fact that technology is useless unless it has a business model associated with it to create value. That's what our students do at Berkeley. Knowledge is also useless unless it flows to capture some of that value to benefit all of society. These are great definitions. Sometimes I wonder, you know, I haven't seen a smart city yet. Um, and maybe it's a pigment of our still our imagination. So I would like to ask the folks on the, on, who are on the panel to introduce themselves briefly 
and say one or two words before we move on to the other questions. Sri Devi, would you, would you start? Yes, yes. Hi, my name is Sri Devi Koneru. I work for Cisco in the Chief Digitization Office, and I lead the Analytics uh, Center of Excellence for Cisco. Good morning. My name is J.H. Chaudhary. I am the Advisor uh, Information Technology, Government of Andhra Pradesh, and also the Special Chief Secretary to Chief Minister of Andhra Pradesh, Mr. Chandra Babu Naidu. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mahesh Krishnaswamy. I work for Google, now Alphabet, and I run uh, manufacturing and supply chain for one of the moonshot programs there, which is called Project Loon. And we try to provide internet access through balloon-powered stratospheric balloons, which basically provide internet access to 4 billion people who don't have internet access right now. Yeah, good morning, everybody. My name is Florian Kolb. I work for one of the largest electricity and gas companies around the world from Europe called RWE. And I'm the managing director of the Silicon Valley activities of this company. Very good. Thank you uh, very much. The first question goes to Mr. Jay Chowdhury. You know, human beings have been fascinated and preoccupied with building cities from the beginning of time. The names often express human longing and aspirations. Babylon, the gate of heaven. Rome, the eternal city. Alexandria, the city of power. Nineveh, the habitation of God. Cairo, the victorious city. Benares, the city of lights, and so on. In the same vein, the human beings now are building smart cities. We often think of them as solutions to our deep longing aspirations uh, and solutions to our problems. Now, will they become a reality? That's a question we have on the table. Will smart cities live up to their meaning? As they have. Oh. As a builder of oh, uh, oh, my God. cities, Mr. Jane Chowdhury built high-tech city in Hyderabad. It is an architect of that, or as the mind behind it. I'm going to ask you this question, because he's now called upon to build Vizac, the city of destinies, that is called. It just keeps going. And the city capital, Amravati, which is also called the city of the eternal city, or the city of Nirvana. <coughs> Innovative and creative uh, chief minister. And those days we had uh, 
problem with the financing. How do we finance creating the smart infrastructure in the city like Hyderabad? But he So he came up uh, with a smart model, very innovative and creative model of PPP, Public Private Partnership, first time in the country. I don't know in other countries it may be already there. But in our country, this was invented. And using that, we were able to build a smart infrastructure. And uh, not only that, the first time in the country, we introduced ICT, because our chief minister always says, everybody is facing problem with the corruption. The common people are not able to meet the officers in the secretariat, and uh, they go round and round, and uh, they pay a lot of money. So how do we make them happy? Today, they are unha unhappy. See, whatever the smartness we have to build, ultimately, the stakeholders have to be happy. He said, why don't we think of building a digital interface? Today, the common man has to go to the officer. Even if I change the officer from one officer to the other officer, where is the guarantee that second officer is not corrupt? So he says, let us use ICT technology, create an interface so that common man need not have to go to the officer. He will go to only the digital interface. That's how first time in the country we introduced e-seva, the first e-governance successfully implemented in the government to basically make the people happy that they don't have to worry about for every damn thing go, going around the officers. So that's why we transformed the Hyderabad today as the, the international destination for any smart companies in the world, including recently Apple also announced that they are going to set up their R&D center in Hyderabad. So we have that experience. With that experience, we are trying to build a new not just a smart city, but smart, smartest city in the state of Andhra Pradesh. Would you talk about some of the barriers and challenges that you have in building yeah. those cities? The main ba barriers and challenges today, more than the smartness, the safety. Safety of the people is uh, very, very concerned. That's the reason why we are calling as a triplet city, smart, secure, and safe city. Safety is very important. That's the reason why our Honorable Chief Minister is talking about the surveillance on the cloud. So that, for example, today, any shop who has got a CCT cameras, if any theft happens in that uh, jewelry shop, he has to inform the police. Police has to go to the shop, then uh, take out all the, uh, the CCTV camera footings. Then only they'll be able to see how they can catch the thief. But today, we are talking about putting all the CCTV cameras, whether they are in the public uh, places or private places, all the information will be on the cloud so that any incident happens, immediately law and order enforcement will be able to have access to that and you are able to resolve that problem and catch the thief. So that is the kind of infrastructure that uh, we are planning to create at this point of time. And uh, security, particularly cyber security, we are talking about the digitalization of uh, India. Before we do the digitalization, we have to secure the digital assets. That's why our Honorable Chief Minister said cyber security is very, very important. So we want to make our city as secure as far as the cyber security is concerned. Then only the smartness is coming. We want to make sure that all these components are built into the, the new city. That is uh, our uh, Vishakapatnam. There are some challenges. Our state, newly formed, we don't have capital city. We don't have finances. That's where our Honorable Chief Minister is coming out with uh, how we can monetize the data that we are going to collect from the citizens, analyze the data, so that using that, a lot of the private players can come and implement the smart components, and also they can make money. That way, I mean, we need not have to spend all the money by ourselves. Our total budget for the Vishakhapatnam uh, smart city is around uh, 2,000 crores. Majority of it is coming through public-private uh, partnership. Some we are getting from the government of uh, India. Some we are investing. But major finances are coming through the PPP model. So we are hopeful that uh, with that we will be able to implement uh, Vishakhapatnam as the, the first India's uh, smart city. 
And uh, with that experience, we are going to build our new capital, which is the Greenfield Capital, where we want to invest the latest technologies, not today, but tomorrow's technologies in the Greenfield city and make that as the technology smart city for the future. Right. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Chaudhry. That's a very good answer, concise answer. Uh, let's turn to um, uh, another expert that we have on, on, uh, on the podium here, um, Ms. Sri Devi from Cisco as uh, our IoT expert. Uh, what does digitalization mean in a world of IoT and smart cities? And, uh, and answer some of the challenges in terms of security and other things that Mr. Chowdhury is talking about. Thank you. But I first wonder why uh, Mahesh passed me the mic as soon as you said expert. I thought it should go right back over there. <laughs> so it almost seemed like a hot potato. Um, so as um, as uh, Mr. Chowdhury was talking about on how brownfield cities are prime to looking at smart, becoming smart cities, digitization is really about taking the evolution of what we already know to be IoT and really taking advantage of the hyperconnected uh, data, uh, the hyperconnected data that we have that comes in through the IoT ecosystem and enhancing the experiences for individual citizens or in the case of a customer, it might be by using that data. For example, if you, um, you we can automate a lot of the banking systems in smart cities, but uh, we still experience this even uh, living in the United States is that the same bank that you're probably depositing your pay slip requires you to submit your first and second paychecks of the month when you ask them for a mortgage or for a loan. So clearly the systems are not always digitizing the processes and hence not really making the experience delightful as some of the companies which actually are digitally born like the Ubers and the Airbnbs which we understand the incumbents like the brownfield cities or the companies which are incumbent struggle with how do you move into a situation of uh, taking advantage of the data and the hyperconnected network enhancing customer experience, enhancing the citizen experience, disrupting some of the processes that we are already comfortable with, but making it a lot more simpler, eliminating perhaps some bureaucratic processes which don't necessarily add value in today's world. So that's what digitization is all about. And when I look, to do, um, look around the world in the industry trends and what my own company is doing over here, is taking advantage of that and also enhancing the smart city experience to being more a smart village experience. And I think we saw those um, awards being given out earlier, is how do we make smart villages a lot more relevant in developing countries? Uh, how about the uh, safety and security issues, which is a major barrier, a major concern that Mr. Chowdhury is talking about, and how does uh, digitization help? Yeah, the, the question was, yeah, the question was about um, how do, with this impending technology explosion that we have, while we solve for some problems, we kind of simultaneously create other problems around security and privacy. So what can we do about that? So as, as we know, there is constant innovation and evolution around enhancing security. And I think the speaker, um, John, before us was talking a lot about how security trumps privacy. So we definitely want to continue to innovate and be very aspirational and look at all the different areas that we have to for a sec creating a secure environment. Because it's very easy to get carried away on enhancing applications and use cases and enhancing experiences with all the data that we have, but forgetting the exposure that we might be creating around both making our data secure, our citizens secure, safety and both physical uh, safety as well, right? When you talk about universities and campuses and late night call centers, physical sec uh, safety is also a big part of this and that's how um, we continue to have to invest in building security and both privacy applications. Very good, thank you. And also, um, make sure you note your questions, and I think there's an app here that we have that takes your questions, and we can, uh, you can entertain some questions at the end. My next question, well, it's, uh, yeah, is that better? Gosh, I need to be right here. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, the next question we have, uh, let's focus on the business model innovation. Uh, we have another expert uh, here, Florian. Um, next question goes to you. Um, 
you know, uh, you are an expert uh, on the um, uh, ex exploring non-traditional uh, business activities and uh, how they affect business operations. And how does this relate to smart cities of the future? Would you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah, first of all, uh, I would briefly go back uh, to the definition uh, that, you, you, that you read to us. I think this is where, where also some of the problems uh, start with smart cities. Uh, the, the definitions are very comprehensive that you mentioned. Uh, the question for me is, are they compelling to the people? Yeah, and uh, so uh, you you said yourself you have a very long sentence from the definition from the United Nation, but you know what does that mean really to the people, and uh, that's where we think actually uh, this topic becomes very interesting because if uh, smart cities are able to um, deliver exponential benefits to to citizens of a city, then it becomes really interesting, and that can be in in multiple areas like. Uh, uh, convenience, like transparency, uh, transportation, uh, security, uh, comfort. Um, so that's what we think it is. It is really about. And uh, when you now ask about, uh, you know, what are the business model innovations that might result out of that? Then uh, we see two distinct group, of course. Yeah, we see uh, the group of existing businesses and the group of uh, future businesses. Yeah, and uh, from our perspective, uh, I mean the. Um, so to say, the, the, uh, the, the new assets that are being created via cities that are getting smarter is, of course, data. Yeah? So uh, if a city is being smartened up, then uh, the amount of data that is available uh, to citizens, um, to, to uh, governments, but also to, to commercial companies uh, will increase very, very significantly, of course. Yeah? I mean, if we have uh, sensors uh, all across the city, um, powered by Cisco equipment, then uh, the amount of data is just exploding and growing very, very exponentially. Now the question is, you know, uh, what are we going to do with this data? What, uh, what does that do to existing business models and to new business models? Now, um, I'm, I will focus more on the new business models because that's an area I find more interesting. Um, we see uh, tons of new potential business areas and activities and ventures starting around, let's say, the data and their applications stemming from cities that are being smartened up. And I would like to give you one example which is close to what we are doing. So I said we are uh, a very large uh, electricity and gas company. So in cities, uh, we normally run uh, the uh, electricity infrastructure that a city has. And if you look to the electricity infrastructure, Actually, we run the infrastructure until the door, so if something uh, behind the meter happens, then, uh, well, that's uh, not, not our issue, so if somebody pulls the plug. But at least, you know, we deliver electrons uh, at a very, very uh, stable rate of quality uh, to people's homes and to, to businesses. So uh, these are, there are some very interesting uh, capabilities that we have that go around uh, security, stability, people trust that, that we deliver in the markets we are active. Now the question for us is, uh, when the city is being smartened up and there are, uh, there's a lot of new data available, how can we apply um, our infrastructure know-how to this data to, for example, beca become a provider for a smart city of very secure, very reliable uh, data infrastructure? And I'm not talking wires. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I mean, we do this every now and then uh, that we also touch wires, but I really talk about more the software and more the platform layer on top of existing wires. Yeah, And um, I think given all the security concerns that have already been mentioned, uh, we believe that this can be a very attractive market for us to tap into. Yeah. Uh, because uh, we don't see that uh, this is uh, happening at least large scale today. Yeah, I mean there are bits and pieces for everything. Yeah, I mean this is not new that you can secure data in many many ways. Yeah, but if we are talking about a large scale infrastructure where let's say the physical world also meets the digital world, then we see a lot of opportunities uh, for us and also for for smaller businesses. And um, yeah, so uh, we we are very very optimistic. Uh, about this future market, um, uh, that this provides many, many great opportunities on, for, for a lot of people. 
Well, thank you very much uh, for that, and uh, please get those questions coming to us. Uh, the last question goes to Google. Um, I would like to ask uh, Mahesh um, a question here that's very uh, passionate to my heart, uh, a course that I'm teaching this semester called Building Smart Villages. There are two groups of people in the world. There's 1.5 billion rich people living in developed uh, nations. Then you have the 5.5 billion poor people living in developing nations. Now the question is, which group benefits most through creation of smart cities, uh, or which groups of people? And can smart cities exist in isolation without rural areas where 70% of the people of the planet live? What solutions does technology offer to bridge this gap? I think that's a good question for Google. And let's look to Mahesh for some answers. Thank you, Solomon. Uh, it's a very interesting question indeed. Um, if you look at the entire population of seven plus billion people out there, you always are posed with the question, where do I really solve the problem? Who, who are the people who really need access? And the short answer is, Everybody. I mean, why should we be just limiting only to the rich people and not to the poor people? The fundamental aspect of connectivity, the whole World Wide Web, is created on the premise that people are connected to each other. And you don't stop at 1.5 billion people. You got to go and solve that entire problem. And therefore, I think that you need to have the entire gamut of people on the same bandwagon and rather than just trying to parse people out based on their economic levels. And just to kind of elaborate that a little bit more in, in detail, we at X, uh, formerly called Google X, um, we work on a bunch of moonshot technologies which are fundamentally trying to solve these audacious projects. Uh, we call it moonshot because it affects more than a billion people. We have a radical solution and we have a breakthrough in technology to bring these things. Just to kind of give you a few examples, some of the projects that are coming out of X right now are the self-driving car where you're trying to see how why, why should we have people always driving, driving the cars? Why can't we have cars just drive autonomously? Uh, another project is called Makani, where we are trying to solve the energy problem, where we can just have a kite-like device that goes around in, in a, a, a circular pattern, tethered to the ground, and through the same tether is able to provide energy back to the grid. Um, and last but not least, the project that's very near and dear to me is called Project Loon, where we are trying to solve the I out of the IoT, which is the internet. And if you look at four, uh, the, the whole population, 4.2 billion people currently don't have proper internet access. That's a big problem. And we are in this world with just a small portion of this two to three billion people connected, but can you just imagine what will happen if you bring the remaining four billion people online? And we are trying to do the same thing through a project called Project Loon, which is uh, a stratospheric ballooning project where we launch balloons at twice the height of commercial aircrafts. They float at 20 kilometers in the altitude, uh, creating a network of cell towers, per se. Um, and then they beam down internet signals of LTE, so you can directly connect to your smartphone, and you're able to have the enrichment of a true connected device at any place you are, anywhere you are. The problem right now is in majority of the rural places, or even in some cities, even here in California, if you go from here to Highway 1, or if you go to Yosemite Valley or the Central Valley, you don't have proper internet connectivity. And if you were to look at Africa and China and India, there's so many people who currently don't have power, who don't have proper internet connectivity. And if you were to try and bring all of those people online, you can just change entirely the paradigm. So the short answer to your question, Solomon, is indeed it is uh, both the, the rich as well as the poor, but the rural part is going to play a very, very key piece of the puzzle, and it's important that we bring them online, and that's how you're going to be able to get a much more enriching connected world of, of IOTs. I think Mr. Chowdhury has a response to that question. I agree with uh, what uh, Mahesh said. Recently we had a very big cyclone called Hudud Cyclone, a lot of people, they lost their lives, and particularly fishermen who were in the high seas, there were no communication for them how to reach out to the place. If only if we have this kind of a loon technology where uh, from uh, ordinary cell phones, they're able to communicate 
with the people and people can direct them how to s take care of uh, their lives and things like that. I think it's a great uh, technology initiative. We are really looking at how we can use uh, Google Loan in our uh, experimental uh, smart city at uh, Vishakhapatnam. More importantly, recently we did one small pilot how this uh, internet bandwidth can help the rural people, the so-called have-nots. We implemented fiber to home in our entire uh, state of Andhra Pradesh. And uh, recently we demonstrated when uh, Cisco Executive Chairman John Chambers was in uh, Vishakhapatnam. In the remotest village near Vijayanagaram, there's a small uh, uh, village. One patient was uh, treated by three doctors simultaneously on the video conference call. One, a local RMP doctor in the village, and the district headquarters doctor also simultaneously on the video conference call, and uh, they were able to see all the records and see the patient. And one expert at the Vishakhapatnam uh, General Hospital, and they were able to figure out simultaneously what is the problem and uh, how uh, that problem can be res resolved. Today, uh, Professor Darwin, in, in India, when a patient has got any uh, heart attack or uh, cancerous uh, uh, kind of a uh, disease and all that, he comes, to, he goes to the nearby city. Not only he, himself, the entire family goes to support him. And though we are getting some insurance cover for the patient, but by the time patient comes back uh, with the family, the family is totally ruined because uh, the cost of uh, living in those cities for the family members to stay there for a month or two or two months and things like that, Just they can't afford to do all that this thing. That's where the technology is going to really help the rural people more than the urbanites. And that's what our honorable chief minister, first time in India, is able to take the fiber to home. We are able to give 20 megabits per, uh, uh, per home in all the 13 million homes in our uh, state. And people are already enjoying the telemedicine, teleeducation, teleagriculture applications. And that's where I mean, he, he wants to see that the have-nots should actually get more benefit because of the ICT technology. And uh, definitely, we want to look at uh, Google Loan, whether uh, they can also help us uh, in uh, removing some of the problems of the citizens. One minute uh, response from Florian, and then we, I will recap, and then we'll take the questions. Yeah, I think uh, when, when looking at business opportunities in the, in the smart city space, uh, it's also very important to consider, I mean, where are really uh, the big problems, yeah, and uh, I mean, for example, our company operates in markets where, uh, let's say, city development and so on are relatively mature, I would say, in, in Europe, yeah, where, I mean, people, you know, there are, there are some issues, but uh, the, the, the average quality of things is, is, is relatively okay and acceptable, and I think the, the challenge will be to really convince the stakeholders, so city governments, municipalities and so on, that smart cities really um, creates additional value to the people. Yeah, that is, that is so, um, so big that they are willing to also uh, look into, let's say, funding some of this. Yeah, that's a big issue. Uh, in Europe, normally cities are bankrupt. Yeah, uh, also sometimes governments are almost bankrupt. Yeah, we have some prominent examples in the European Union. So uh, let's say, the funding issue is, is a big, big unsolved issue, and also uh, to which extent is this really meaningful to people? Yeah. So, do I need to know, uh, you know, uh, all all, all uh, unoccupied parking spaces, or do I just drive around for ten minutes to find one? Of course, from an environmental perspective, that's an interesting problem to solve. But um, uh, I mean, we are looking also uh, to find areas where where problems are really big and pressing and then to do something there rather in, in these very mature, slow-moving markets. Very good. Um, let me go ahead and, you want to recap? No, I just want to say, he should uh, go switch. ahead, go ahead, please. He should, he should switch to driverless cars then. <laughs> okay. All right. All right, let me, let me do some recapping. While I was in uh, Vishakhapatnam earlier this year, uh, my students were presenting to the chief minister the business models, how to make Vishakhapatnam smart. In the evening, he called me to his table uh, while he was eating. I said, you know, I love this wonderful thing. Your students are brilliant. The solutions are great, technology as well as business models. But I want you to think about this one thing. I want you to, your next project is going to be making villages smart. He said, you know, I, cities, making a few cities smart is great. 
but, uh, but making villages smarter is better. If you take 650,000 villages in India, make them a bit smarter, it has much more of an exponential impact on GDP than making a few cities smart. The reason for that, there's a lot of wisdom in what he inspired me to do, and uh, so I'm teaching that class this semester. Uh, because when you go to a village, you see the business model. You see, oh, this is a village that makes textiles, or fisheries, coconuts. And you can inspire those people, like uh, Mahesh was saying, if you give them power, through Mekani power, which is green. You know, one of those Mekani units, which I like Mahesh to put into one of our villages there that we are prototyping, can power five villages or one whole town. It's all just wind up there in the sky. Or the loon that can give 700 megahertz of connectivity to a village. If you give people power, if you give them connectivity, they don't need PhDs, they don't need bachelor's degrees. People are intelligent naturally. Give them tools, give them resources, give them access, and they'll do a phenomenal job. And that's the course that I'm teaching. I'm not just teaching with one company. I have many companies. I have uh, IBM. We have uh, Google. We have Cisco. We have um, also uh, Qualcomm, you know, Siraj, Tech Mahindra, Ericsson. All of these companies, Tyco, are working with me in scaling down the technologies to make a small village in India smart. It's the actual village, 7,000 people. We're making it smart from September to, to December. We're going to prototype and co-create a village as the villagers come and interact with the technologies and build their own brand and their own business models and see what they will do if you give them power and if you give them access, if you give them communication. And some of you might be interested in joining me in this force. And uh, Mr. Chandrababu Naidu is uh, so inspired about this project. He inspired me. He's going to come on December 29th and inspect the village. And we're going to take a consensus vote. All of the 7,000 people in the village will vote using the cell phones. Yes, this is the village we want. This is the technology we want because it delivers value at price points we can afford. It enables us, it empowers us, and 40, uh, 40 villages surrounding this little village will come to view it and say, you know, and express their opinion and say, this is what we want. And that's the next project that we're doing, and I hope that uh, you'll join me in that. And I just want to thank uh, Mahesh for cooperating, and I also want to thank uh, Mr. Jay Chowdhury for uh, coming here and encouraging people to participate in this enormous project. My next project is in China. China has one million villages. Just imagine making those villages smart. This summer I'm going there to pick a village to make one of those villages do a prototype there. So I think that's where it is. We got it wrong. I believe, my own personal view, is instead of starting from the top and saying, let's build a city artificially, let us do it organically like our ancestors have done. When the civilizations, past civilizations were built right next to a river, they are river civilizations. Mesopotamia on Tigris, Egypt on the Nile, India on the Indus, China on the Yellow. And those villages built around these rivers, which is a source of life, which was revered as goddesses and deities, cities were built. It's an organic growth. Maybe what we need to do is think about my own personal view is start with villages, and I think the city should be built. We create a better brand, better community, better connectivity uh, in that way. With that, let's take some questions. My first question um, goes to um, Mr. Chowdhury. It's all about money, Mr. Chowdhury. Uh, you started with a state that does has, has no money, right? You just started with um, uh, zero. And how are you getting all this money to build these cities? And uh, how are you doing with it? Yeah, it's, um, ours is a, like a startup company. Ours is a startup state. Like a startup company, we don't have money. We don't have infrastructure. But we have a lot of ideas. And we have got a great leader and a great team. And we are sure that we will be able to overcome all these things and create one of the vibrant states in the country, maybe in the Asia itself, and we have lots of uh, 
ideas. We don't want to share the IP at this point of time. We are in the stealth mode. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's very, very wise. So, um, um, just one comment on that is uh, when we, um, when at Cisco especially, we uh, look at uh, how do we balance the social value and the economic value of creating smart cities, we, we often, and most of the topics and the discussions today are clearly on so much of the social value that we can create by uplifting the villages and the rural economy and just bringing basic necessities to the rural society and the rural citizens in India and other developing nations. But there is also a significant responsibility on both the technology providers, as well as um, Mr. Chaudhary is saying to the state governments and the federal governments to um, balance that with economic value as well. So to make it a self-sustained environment. And thus is the brand of whatever you would create, whether it's a company, a privately held company, a public held company, shareholder value, or whether they sustain themselves. So you do one prototype today, and then how do you uh, scale that beyond that is by you balance the economic and the social value, it creates that self-sustained ecosystem. Very, very good. I think uh, they were telling me that we're running out of time, uh, but uh, great summary. And I think we will wait uh, around here for another you know, 10, 15 minutes and take your questions more individually. I'm sure that you have specific questions. And uh, you can always look me up. Uh, there's only one Solomon Darwin in the world in Google, so uh, it takes me to the faculty page. So. I get bombarded. So thank you very much. And shall we give them a hand, please? Thank you, thank you very much.